What's the formula for going viral? Robinhood had a million emails before they even launched. Dropbox grew 3,900 times in one and a half years. Morning Brew got 1.5 million subscribers in just 18 months. And Hotmail back in the day got 12 million users in just two years. So how did they do it? How did they go viral? I did the research and there is a four step virality framework. Welcome back to my channel, I'm Vicky. If you're new here, we talk about frameworks for clear thinking and clear communications. And today we're talking about virality, specifically the viral customer acquisition framework. And according to Harvard business prof, Tom Eisenman, there's four mechanisms. The first is direct network effect. Second, good old word of mouth. Third, casual contact. And fourth, incentives. Now let's go into each one of them, talk about what they are and give you some examples to see how they work in real life. First, direct network effect. This is when you build virality into the product. It simply means that the product works better when there's two or more users. And so the user, him or herself, is incentivized to get more users onto the platform. So social media, things like Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, all of these bring people together, as well as collaboration tools like Canva, like Trello, Slack. Anything with an element of community usually has this built in. And that leads to the second point, which is word of mouth. You've built something that's shareable. Now you want people to share it. And these days recommendations go from more than just friends and family to influencers, to experts. And this works for three reasons. One, it boosts trust. Two, it reduces the perceived risk. And three, it's highly relevant coming from your friends, your family, the influencers that you follow. Someone has already curated this and suggested you to try it out. Pinterest is a classic example of how something grew by word of mouth. The platform found its first 3,000 users through word of mouth, through family, through friends, just in the local craft community of Des Moines where the founder is from. But after the 3,000 users or so, it was really difficult for them to expand the network further. They hit their first growth ceiling and what happened was the founder Silberman, he would continue to use word of mouth by going to local craft stores and hold meetups for craft enthusiasts. And at the meetups, they would hand out physical flyers to craft enthusiasts asking them to try out Pinterest. It's really humble beginnings for a now almost $40 billion company. And many other companies did very similar things. Airbnb founders first went out there to each of the houses and took the photos themselves. Uber did something similar. They went to convention centers in the beginning. They went to train stations at peak hour where it was hard to catch a taxi and they would approach people in person trying to get them to try their product. This definitely piques your interest a lot more than just seeing an ad on Instagram, right? The point is to get people to share this through word of mouth. And people share when something leaves an impression on them. Now, the third mechanism is casual contact. Even though you've built a product that's shareable, you've delivered an experience that's memorable for people to share word of mouth, there's nothing stopping you from letting your users subtly pass on the words to other potential users. Ever wonder why Apple puts in the signature sent from my iPhone? It's the exact hack that Hotmail used to grow their user base to 12 million in just two years get your free email at Hotmail. And repeatedly, this has worked really well. Superhuman, another hot startup in the email space is doing the same. They have the signature sent via Superhuman. And because they had an invite only launch, when potential users looked up Superhuman, they would see that, oh, not everyone gets to use this. And this triggers FOMO, this triggers questions sent to the original users to ask about how did you find superhuman? Is it helpful? Is it worth the try? And you build in the loop of getting people to talk about your product. Also sounds a little bit like Clubhouse in the early days, right? Now, number four, incentives. This is also hugely important and is frequently used by a lot of startups to go viral. And it's also very straightforward. You get something by referring the product to other people. It could be monetary, but it doesn't have to be and I'll share a few examples with you here. Tesla is a great example. In the early days, they offered $1,000 for one referral who bought a car. And each car was around 70 to $100,000. And just like that, it was 
almost 70 to 100 times ROI, minus the cost of running the referral program, of course, but that's pretty impressive. And of course, you don't just need to use money, right? Tesla now, they don't do the cash incentive anymore. You'll get supercharging for free and people are happy about that. They are still willing to refer for that free supercharging. You can give away a portion of your product because they have a high perceived value where the cost to fulfill it for you is low. For example, Dropbox gives away a few free gigabytes when you refer other people to use the cloud storage. The extra storage is cheaper for you, but more expensive for the user. So there is a really obvious gain for them. Evernote grew to 11 million users in two years by doing a try before you buy. Or you can be creative and add a milestone strategy where the more someone shares, the better their rewards become. The Hustle and Morning Brew are classic examples of this. The Hustle grew to a million users with just 7,000 brand ambassadors. Morning Brew got 1.5 million subscribers in just 18 months by following a similar strategy. Viral growth happens when one plus one equals three or more. If you're curious about the details behind the scenes of how startups got their first 1,000 users users and beyond, make sure to check out the database I've compiled in the first link below. Now, especially for viral customer acquisition, it's important to note how companies leverage cognitive biases beyond just these four mechanisms. I've talked about cognitive biases in a previous video here, so you can check that out. In essence, it's about understanding how the human psychology works and how does that translate into behavior. So you can word in the right incentives, the right messaging for people to want to share what you have. The database explains the different cognitive biases used for each of the company's example, so make sure to check it out. If you learned something new in this video, make sure to give it a big thumbs up. It really helps the channel. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll share a few more videos on cognitive biases as well as other examples of how companies grew to their first 1,000 plus users, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!